tú quieras usar, pero acuérdate que todo el tiempo que te pase, pues es menos tiempo para sí, 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 sí. Y luego a las una y media nos quedamos ya informalmente, podemos seguir platicando. Sí. ¿Me podrías decir cuando yo voy ya cinco minutos así? Al 35. Al 35, quiero saber. Okay, ya avisamos. Hello everyone, I'm Alberto Díaz-Calleros, director of the Center for Latin American Studies here at Stanford. Um, we are here for today's Friday lecture, Linguistic Co-Responsibility Between Indigenous Peoples and the Mexican State. There's a stretch between what is said and what is done by Professor Emiliana Cruz, Cruz from CSS. Um, I do want to kindly note for those of you who are watching through our live stream that we will continue to make those um, videos public through our class YouTube page after the event. Uh, but kindly note that if you have uh, questions, please submit those questions into the chat of the YouTube channel and I will make sure I'm monitoring those and will uh, read them to our speaker in the Q&A session. Um, for those of us who are here in the uh, Stanford campus, uh, we are in the land and the territory of the Ohlone original peoples. Um, we offer gratitude for the land, for the water, for the air that surrounds us. And we want to pay our respects to the past, to the present and to the future of the Ohlone peoples who continue to be present here uh, in their homelands and throughout their diasporas. I want to add, and I will keep on saying this, that unless Stanford, and this is something that was noted to me by an indigenous intellectual who I highly respect, until Stanford actually makes a significant effort to bring Ohlone peoples into the Stanford student body, we are maybe making some empty gestures. That would be one of the most obvious reparations we can do as a university. And I would add, we have a diaspora of many indigenous peoples who come from Latin America who migrated, many of them are already first generation Americans, who happen to be Chatino or Zapotec or uh, Trique, who are here around us, and that's another area where Stanford could, make, could do much better. Emiliana Cruz Cruz was born in uh, Cieneguilla, San Juan, Guayje, that's correct, I hope, Oaxaca, Mexico. She's a linguistic anthropologist and a professor researcher at CSS uh, Ciudad de Mexico. Her trajectories of research uh, and diverse intellectual and interdisciplinary work have emphasized education, linguistic rights, territory, uh, documentation, and linguistic revitalization. Uh, she has received the Distinguished Community Engagement Award from the University of Massachusetts um, uh, for her Chatino language documentation project. Uh, she has extensive experience in community collaborations in, uh, that basically are the hallmark of her work. Uh, she's a founding member of the Collective Dialogues between Indigenous Academics. Um, her recent publications include Evitemos que nuestro futuro se nos acabe en las manos, Tomás Cruz Lorenzo y la nueva generación Chatino, a product of collaboration among Chatinos as well as theoretical reflections around the role of fieldwork in linguistics and linguistic anthropology. Um, uh, so thank you so much for being with us here in the Well, uh, thank you for the invitation. It, it is uh, great to come back to Stanford. And uh, um, so I am... So, technical situations. Okay, so I want to uh, share with you when I started, uh, around what time I started doing what I, uh, what I you know, currently do. So when I was um, living in Mexico, uh, I always had the dream to be able to understand uh, my native language, which is Chatino. But, uh, you know, my education was only done in Spanish and, uh, um, and also we didn't find any spaces to be able to study our, you know, native languages there. So I was in, uh, um, in college when I started reading about linguistic rights and I came to this uh, um, piece by Keenan Malik and I thought it was really interesting. It really spoke to me and... Uh, uh, and, you know, it's, um, 
it's this phrase that it really continues um, um, echoing in my, my work and also I feel that uh, there are many people who feel, you know, what uh, Malik is saying is just like, a, like, who cares, right? Like, why even bother? Like, why should we, like, you know, give funding to pro linguistic projects? Why should we be, like, worrying, or, you know, why should we care about uh, languages that are spoken by a few people? And, uh, um, and so in this presentation, I want to talk to you like uh, why I think it's important and why it's important to the indigenous people and um, also why it should be important to all of us. And uh, um, so in 2019, there was a, um, a year of indigenous languages and this is a UNESCO um, uh, had that, you know, year. And uh, so during that year, there were a lot of events and it's interesting to see like, you know, what happened in that year and what people, you know, were doing uh, in that year. And uh, uh, we know that indigenous um, languages are disappeared. And uh, uh, we know that um, some languages, uh, they have, you know, according to uh, some um, Research is that we have about you know seven thousand languages, and you know the speed that these languages are um, uh, going away is just you know really dramatic. So uh, they decided to you know bring to uh, you know uh, to the attention to this situation. So they made that a year of indigenous languages. Then um, after that year, they realized that actually there is a, a, even you know. A, a very critical uh, situation about uh, indigenous languages. So they were like, okay, so let's do a decade, right? So let's really uh, not spend one year, but let's spend 10 years in, uh, um, in doing actions. Like we have to do, um, do something about uh, um, these languages. And so anyway, in Mexico City, so there was this uh, uh, meeting and and of course, you have you know uh, politicians and UNESCO people. Then you have like all these you know um, I don't know important people, important figures uh, to you know come and take a picture. And it was uh, like a big celebration. I didn't go. I just you know sat and uh, I was like a kind of looking into the uh, social media and see what they were doing. But uh, um, I usually don't go to those events. But uh, it was important to um, kind of understand. Right. What is the project? Why is it that they, you know there is a decade? What is it going to happen with that um, decade? And uh, uh, what is the government planning on doing? Or you know or who is going to do it? Right? Who's going to do the work? I mean, it sounds great to have a decade, but uh, um, now what are we uh, going to do about it? Uh, there is a really beautiful article written by Yasnaya Aguilar about the Three Kings. And uh, so then they want to like, um, indigenous languages are like, you know, they write in their, um, you know, list of things that they want for, you know, from the three kings. And it's a really beautiful um, article. So if you can, uh, uh, you can check out the article. So this is the actual the UNESCO. Uh, this is the resolution. This is something what they said at that decade, this is what is going to happen, right? That this is so we have, you know, like okay, we know that education systems in Mexico, including indigenous education, is not really working, you know, with languages, but we're gonna, you know, make it work. So then, so we also, you know, they said, well, we know that, you know, uh, injustice, we need to bring languages and, you know, climate change and. We need to, you know, have, you know, technology in indigenous languages. Also, uh, you know, like in uh, the health system and, uh, um, you know, this, all of these amazing, you know, things that the UNESCO and the Mexico, Mexican government is promising to indigenous people to, uh, you know, that would include this right in the uh, decade. So, um, but... What we know is that the education system in Mexico is going to be really hard to change. And that uh, it's a very clear project that the Mexican government and the Mexican, you know, to build that state, the education, it's, you know, it's very important. So then we have a right uh, um, indigenous education system. So then they are like, a, you know, no 
intentional project to really change those um, and that you know um, situation in education. So starting from there, we don't we don't really know if one day maybe like a, the way I think is is that if we get new people, new teachers, if we get teachers that are really willing to do something different, so maybe. But I think it in terms of like the state actually changing this education system, it's going to be super difficult. So we have many people incarcerated in Mexico, and they often don't get a, a you know a, a trial in their native languages. So we have. So many, so many stories, uh, including the U.S. and Mexico as well. So, and uh, we also with the, you know, climate changes uh, by diversity. So we see that there are all these uh, mega projects, all these mining concessions, all these like the, the you know, Tren Maya, which is really, you know, um, good example. So. So on the one hand, right, so we're thinking, of, well, we need to preserve this, but uh, these, um, the territories, how does, you know, these languages are, you know, part of the indigenous territory. So that that is something that I feel that uh, it's not being negotiated in that, uh, uh, with this, you know, um, proposal that they're given. But also we think about it in terms of like the health system. So. We, you know, know that indigenous communities, they often don't have, you know, like hospitals. They don't have, in uh, the doctors that come to the communities, they, they don't speak the native language. And also, like, it, we even are in these days, you will still have, like, some signs that says, like, bring your own interpreter, meaning that bring someone from, you know, your home who can, you know, speak for you. So, um, anyway, so how do we, you know, um, like, ask, Indigenous people, how do we think about this? Well, it sounds really pretty, right? What the government is promising and what the UNESCO, you know, uh, will like to um, think that it uh, will happen. So instead, what the, really it's important, right? What the way I see this is that what Mexico wants is that it wants to have indigenous people who look indigenous. So we... Uh, there is this, you know, idea that, okay, you have to, you know, like, uh, continue speaking your language because if you speak your language, then uh, you're indigenous. And then if you're indigenous, and then you have to continue wearing your beautiful clothes so we can, you know, uh, show you that, so, you know, we have indigenous people. And that, um, it's uh, what we see in local schools. So this is a community... Um, uh, near my town, and the, so the national anthems, right? so are like sung in uh, in Chapino, and uh, um, and it, that's you know the way for the government to say, you know what, we're doing something. We have now we have translated the national anthems into the local language, so that's you know important. So uh, we're not talking about the national anthem here, but it's is really interesting that uh, that is an important. Uh, song for you know uh, for to have a translation. So we, so then indigenous you know then in the local schools they you know, children like you know uh, wear the traditional clothing and they march with the flag and they sing the national anthem in uh, Chatino, and that's something that is you know uh, is colorful, is cute, and uh, and that means that you know we we're working on it. So that's sort of like the general uh, you know. Um, thing that I'm uh, uh, looking into and so what I want to do now is to show you what what we actually we're doing in our communities without any uh, support from you know the UNESCO from you know the Mexican government and so I'm going to talk about uh, the Chatino languages, and then the municipality, and then I want to talk about specifically about that language that is spoken in San Juan Quiaique. And then I'm going to share with you the different projects that we're working on, and then the uh, Chatino language documentation project. So, okay, uh, so then, uh, so I want to tell a story about uh, uh, who knows about France, uh, who knows. Uh, Friends Boss. Not that you know him as a person, but have you heard of him? Friends Boss. Okay. So, Friends Boss, right, uh, went to Oaxaca, went to the coast, and then he ran into someone and wanted to learn about Chatino. 
and this was in 2013, that's when he made the report. And uh, he talked to a person, and that person uh, t uh, reported him to talk to another person. That uh, they were like, you know, uh, some languages in the region, and they, and then Boaz actually made a report based on that conversation um, that there were three uh, languages, and one, uh, one was like, I think it the um, uh, high, uh, mid, and the other. I think that's what he called it. And so, and. Uh, at the end, like we, what we uh, study all of these um, communities, and we study, you know, uh, all we visited these communities, and we studied the local language, and we actually came up with the same thing that Boaz came up with. <laughs> and uh, um, it, what it was really interesting that uh, the way he did it, right? He talked to one person, the person talked to another person. So anyway, and uh, uh, so, but he took the credit, <laughs> and uh, so. Now we have three Chatino languages. And why I call it Chatino languages? Because uh, we have, for example, if I say, for example, French, Spanish, and Portuguese, they were actually the same thing. They are, you know, um, it's, you know, French is not a language. It's just a dialect of Spanish or something like that, right? So, of course, someone, you know, if I said that, someone would say, like, no, it's a language. So it's the same thing that is uh, happening here. So we have, in the gray area, we have the Sensontepec Chatino, and that one is uh, closer to the Proto Chatino. And uh, we have the uh, darker area, that is the Tatatepec Chatino, that is um, kind of like changing, like it is more innovative. And then we have that whole region, the uh, light, uh, the white area, that's the Eastern Chatino, that's where the Boas uh, reported was the, uh, the other. And so, why this is important? Because it is important because in Mexico, they have a catalog of, uh, of indigenous languages, and they say the Chatino uh, as Chatino language. And, uh, um, and so, when uh, we often get calls for interpretation, they just send us, like, sometimes um, someone uh, at a hospital, we need an interpreter of Chatino. And we're like, yeah, from where? Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then not just that, because in that region, like in the white region, there are 15 varieties of Chatino. So then, uh, so you have to tell that, you know, if you're looking for an interpreter, you have to say Chatino from this community or this municipality. So, uh, and then even with the catalog that uh, um, uh, Inali has, it is uh, Institute of Indigenous Languages, which is disappearing, uh, is it has a Chatino, so it is, uh, so therefore uh, the rights of indigenous languages that is they're violating the rights of you know these communities because when you have to create materials for these languages, they you have to you know uh, make the materials accordingly, right? It's like if I gave materials to French speakers, and I said, okay, here's a book in Spanish, so that's your material, right? It's just, it, that's what we're doing. So this is why uh, for us it's important for uh, the Chatino, uh, Chatino languages to be recognized as languages because they're very different. And uh, um, the whole, like, the Eastern Chatino, those are not that different. Even if uh, they speak, like, different is the same language. It's just they speak with different varieties. And so... Uh, but you will have to, you know, create materials for Sansontepec, for Tatatepec, and for Eastern Chatino. In the Eastern Chatino, you have to decide uh, for each uh, village. So we have two. Uh, this is San Juan Quiaije, and uh, uh, in the map we're in the south, and uh, um, and uh, the two communities. Uh, the one. Towards us is San Juan, and the other one is in Iguilla, that's my hometown. And uh, um, this community is really interesting because they, uh, uh, there is the municipality that where you can still hear Chatino in the streets, children playing in Chatino. This is like, you know, the uh, speakers, uh, yeah, when they make announcements in the community, it's all in Chatino. So we have... Um, but also, uh, about like uh, 30 years, a lot of people started migrating to the U.S. And now you will hear, right, uh, also Spanish, 
uh, English, and so in schools you will have children who own, who are like sometimes monolingual in English or Spanish or uh, or some that are you know trilingual. So it's uh, really interesting uh, to see. And uh, um, so local schools they don't use Chatino, uh, and the only you know the instructions are done in Spanish. And there is a lot of migration to the U.S. So we have in California, you um, you're not gonna find people from uh, uh, Kiaije. They're mainly in North Carolina, uh, in Florida, and some in Seattle. And a lot of them they work in uh, uh, Chinese uh, restaurants. That's kind of like the industry that uh, they're in. And uh, um, they're really proud of their Chatino. The, the people like it when you say what is you know. Um, what does it mean to speak Chatino, right? And so people say, that, you know, I love my language, but also I, you know, I want to learn Spanish and English. And uh, um, so anyway, so people are really open about it. But we have a generation of um, people that are monolingual in Chatino, and that this interaction now with these new generations that are not learning the language. And this is a story of Julia, who, uh, what I did was uh, uh, the community turned um, 50 years. And uh, uh, so I interviewed people like about, you know, um, what they think of a Chatino, if they think that Chatino will survive, or, uh, and I reported many people. So it was really interesting what she had to, you know, tell us about her relationship with the uh, grandchildren who are living in the U.S. what I told them. I think that Chatino language is more difficult to learn than Spanish. Uh, and I said, also, Chatino is, beautiful, is a beautiful language. Yes, the Chatino language is great. It's beautiful. I want to speak to my children in Chatino. We don't understand each other because they only speak Spanish. I do not speak Spanish. When they come to visit, we cannot communicate. I wish I could talk to them. Uh, they are in the Norte. I know they love me, I love them too, but we cannot communicate. I love my grandchildren, unfortunately, we cannot communicate. When they see me, they touch my clothes, they comb my hair, they do, not, they do many things to show me their love. How can we talk? This is my situation with my grandchildren who live in the North. So um, that's sort of, uh, we're starting to see, right, our grandparents who, uh, have a hard time now because they, you know, they're monolingual in Chatino and uh, the uh, children are, you know, uh, being raised in uh, Spanish or English in the, uh, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So about the language, uh, we might not have time to, you know, like show you the words that I wanted to show you, but this is a, uh, it's a language that has 12 tones. Mm -hmm. In tones, is that uh, tones change meaning? Like we know, you know, many uh, Asian languages, like you know, uh, Chinese and um, other languages, is monosyllabic, meaning that a lot of consonants are together. So uh, linguists 
um, they don't really like to work with this kind of language because it's a lot about you know hearing, right? And you have to be really um, good at uh, hearing the language and to you know hear twelve tones. And uh, um, so anyway, so here are the you know the, um, the tones, and we have like. Uh, the number four, right, so we have the level tones, we have the falling tones, and we have the rising tones. And so we have here the number four, that one, um, also this language, uh, when you're speaking the language, the tones will change depending on like where you find the word, so the, and there are some tones that don't change, and there are tones that do change. And so this one, uh, a tortilla, is one of those tones that uh, uh, will change if it's next to, it gets affected by, you know, the previous tone. So, and the, uh, this tone is a super high tone, and you're not gonna find, you know, in the list uh, in isolation, just by itself. You're gonna find it when you're, you know, talking. So, so we have, you know, uh, this, uh, later I can read you the, if we have time. So, okay, so, um, when, uh, when we do this kind of work, uh, when I started doing a, um, linguistics, like, like I was telling you with the Malik story, right, that uh, really impacted me to kind of say, like, why is that we want, you know, why do we want to do this, right? Like, why I uh, want to study this language? And I felt like, okay, my whole education has been in Spanish and English, and why not write it uh, in Chapino? Like, and I just felt that it was something that it's uh, um, it's important, right, uh, to be able to go to a classroom with the teacher when you have materials in your language, and none of that um, I, you know, had, and so I um, created a project, a linguistic project, to study um, the Chatino languages, and so then uh, after, you know, I knew how to write and do all these great things with the language. Um, I started a uh, landscape project. Uh, and then uh, um, once, you know, like you have the tools and also, you know, train people how to do it. Um, and then uh, uh, with a group of people that uh, left the community that migrated to different um, parts of Mexico, because there are, there are two type of migrations, the ones that only go to uh, different states in Mexico in those who leave. And uh, since, you know, a lot of the people that uh, uh, leave to come to the U.S., um, they often don't have a way to go back because of the um, documents. And then so they, you know, take a very long time to go back or often, like some of them they haven't, you know, gotten back since they came. So it's for those who, you know, uh, migrate in Mexico, they uh, usually leave because they, you know, go to school and then come back. So uh, when, um, so I will, you know, tell you a little bit more about the group. And then uh, we created a literacy project. And then we right now working with the Endless um, uh, project. And uh, we also created a keyboard for the language. And also uh, we, how we are infiltrating into the school system. And uh, uh, we also have a uh, language consultants, and um, I repeated that. I don't know. Uh, it's I think at the CLDP. Oh, I don't know uh, what went wrong in that thing. But okay. So this is uh, Tony Woodbury, and uh, he's a professor in uh, UT Austin. And uh, uh, when I met him, I was like, okay, so I'm ready to study my language. He says, okay, I don't know anything about your language. So, um, so we like, we decided that, okay, you know, like, how do I do it? How do I, you know, where do I start, right? He says, I don't know, I don't know where you start. So we decided that we were going to travel to different communities starting uh, in my community. And uh, so we spent a lot of summers like trying to figure out this language. And uh, um, so I was doing, you know, linguistic courses. And uh, uh, so then I would do field work. And uh, uh, we ended up actually recruiting other linguists. And uh, uh, so we traveled to all of those um, like communities that I showed you. And that's how we came up with the, you know, what Boas already, uh, uh, you know, reported. Uh, and um, but uh, what I, you know, I have my rules, right? If 
you uh, want to right, have this project, it has to be in my terms and it has to be done with the communities and it has to be done for the communities. And uh, uh, so it happened that the two of us, we you know, uh, got along really well and uh, we um, did an, an amazing project. Uh, now we have been able to you know, study all those languages now with you know, those communities are creating their own materials using Right, uh, the things that we found, uh, we you know presented in those communities and uh, we work uh, with the uh, with the communities and uh, uh, so the way it works in Mexico is, is that you can come. Uh, I think in Mexico it's like heaven for a lot of uh, intellectuals. You can just go and get into any community and do what you need to do, do your research, and never go back, and that's fine. But um, in other places in the world, but you cannot do that in here in the U.S., for example. If you go to an Native American, you know, you, you have to follow, you know, certain rules. And uh, uh, more and more now, indigenous communities in Mexico, they are, like, um, using that practice. that They want you to, you know, introduce yourselves to the authorities. You need to say, like, why you're doing what you're doing. If you have funding, like, where the funding comes from. And... Uh, um, so all of this, even if I am part of the community, especially because I'm part of the community, because uh, Tony, right, uh, he can live and he lives in Austin, he has a job, but I, I have to go back and see my grandpa. So I wanna make sure that whatever I do, it's done you know, according to the rules of the community. And, uh, uh, but then we did the same thing, uh, traveling in different communities, and uh, especially like at the, because there were no, um, not many like research done in Chatino languages. People were really interested, it's a re and that's a part that I feel that a linguistics is like uh, really practical. If you you know uh, if you want to make it practical, so uh, a lot of these communities were really happy that we're you know uh, we're coming to uh, to study the language and. Uh, um, so I did that with uh, Tony. That was twenty years ago when I um, when I met him. And so now, what is the um, so I uh, I always had this like feeling that uh, my parents took me away from my community, and I will always, you know, be uh, given a hard time because they did that. So when uh, when I was a child, I was uh, I, we went to the city to study Spanish. That was a very common thing to do to children, indigenous children around that time when I was a child, and so. That means that uh, um, my uh, my knowledge of animals, of plants, and the you know uh, ceremonies that uh, happens in a territory, I I didn't do them as much as you know someone who was raised in uh, uh, the community, and uh, um, so I ran into situations when I was transcribing. Uh, the language, there are a lot of toponyms that were in there, a lot of names of plants. And, and then I was like, what is that? Like, I, I was, something was missing in my work because I couldn't, uh, like, uh, mentally, I couldn't locate that place, right? Where the narrative happened, what that, you know, where you grow a certain plant or something like that. So, but I realized that uh, uh, young people as well, they don't, because they go to school and they're in a classroom, they, they don't go out. Like before people used to go farming, they used to you know, go you know, for business, religious uh, reasons, they will hike a lot. Even in a ceremony for uh, when a baby is born, they heat up their feet, so the feet will be strong so they can walk. So walking is a very, it was a, something very important to this community. So then uh, what I did is that I decided that I wanted to, you know, hike those mountains. I wanted to learn about those mountains. I wanted to um, see, also, I was really interested in, like, to uh, see the narrative, the memories that people will have when they went to a physical place. Because it's, when you do research um, and you interview someone, it's a very different uh feeling, right? But if you get up and you walk with a person, 
So probably the different, you know, ways of how you know the person will explain something to you because uh, you're you're moving, you are like you know in the smells and the sounds and so I was really interested in like to you know uh, have that as a project with young people. So we um, we will hike every time I will go, especially in the summertime. And so we just you know we'll take our hikes and uh, go with someone, and then we will document you know the. Um, the stories, uh, we'll do videos, uh, audio recording, and we also collect, you know, uh, plans. We drew maps by hand, um, and uh, I want to show you how amazing this place looks like on a map. Once, like, you put it on a map, can you please? Um, and uh, we, you know, um, wrote the. Um, So that's uh, Kiai here, right? You know, uh, it's just fun to see it like that. And then the closer it gets, it's even more and more exciting. And then, and then you get deeper and deeper. <laughs> you could use the right. Sorry, where? You could use the map. Okay. Does it have a scrolling? In the right, it's kind of like invisible, but you see the <clears throat> the north arrow on the right. Yeah. If you go below that, there's a zoom. It adds a zoom. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can stop it there. <laughs> so what we did was instead of we hiked with like many people, and then uh, we would do the map of where we will go, and then we also um, we will like put on that you know map like the photo, the audio, and the information that we found in each. Uh, place, but we also documented, you know, the ceremonial areas. We documented the creeks. We uh, tried to document as much as we could. Once we had all of that, so we did all the points, and then we will have people who, because not everyone is into uh, maps. Um, a lot of elders they get really bored with it. But a lot of like uh, younger people, they get really into maps. So, so then we will have people also uh, come in to you know see these. We'll make the map uh, big, and then we will just make sure right uh, um, if we had the point at the right place. And it was amazing what we got. And so he was like, "No, move the thing a little bit. Uh, it's just above this." Um, so anyway, so that is a project that uh, um, uh, now uh, we are putting this into smaller maps for children. And so we like have like, you know, black and white, and then we put a certain names so they can, you know, color it. And then they can, you know, go with their grandparents and say, hey, you know, what are you for? Like, show me. So we're like, a, you know, making this more like now interactive, but it's really nice to be able to have, this is kind of like the base to be able to do some other stuff. And uh, uh, so we include, you know, like uh, sounds sometimes, uh, you know, we show it in, um, to the uh, classrooms, but uh, but this is a really uh, good way to get to know your territory, to know, to get to know the stories. But also, I think it really it's useful to think about how you can apply, uh, how you can bring this information into the classrooms. And so, I will get into um, you can drop. So I um, I continue doing this. I continue hiking with. Uh, with people, with young people, to document um, 
the landscape. And so then um, I worked, uh, there, there are other people who are not in the photo, but we have more people. So what I did is that I trained people in the community to become linguists because I don't live in a community. And uh, um, when I go there, I you know teach, but it's better to have people in the community to do it also. Uh, the linguistic work, and so we have Maria Elena, Claudia, and Tomas. Those are the experts in the community, and they have taken like whatever it took me like years to learn. Uh, it's just like you know, for them it was a lot uh, faster and easy, right? Uh, once you have um, the writing system, once you have, once you understand the language, then to you know teach it to others is a lot easier than for me. Like I just had no materials, like no one had done any research in this language, so I had to really start from scratch. And uh, um, so then, um, the group that I was telling you about that migrated uh, to. Um, that went to school and then came back. Happened that uh, um, most of us came back at the same time. I was uh, I was working in Massachusetts and then I went back to Mexico, and um, they were like also back to the community. So then we started like creating like a school. It wasn't really it's not really school. It's just like we call it school because we did a school. But um, it's a place where we all learn and we all you know come and share like. Uh, sometimes we read an article, sometimes we write, um, and, uh, but the main thing that they wanted to do was they wanted to learn how to write Chatino. And so once like, you know, they, uh, we started going with the language part, uh, then uh, now we produce material. So we, when we get together now, what we do is just like create stories for children. And, uh, um, and you know, we work with the bachelors of the map. And uh, uh, so it's interesting because they all come from a different background. Like one is, uh, went to medical school, another was an economist, another was a lawyer, uh, and uh, um, another one is an architect, another one is a teacher. But they all, what they wanted to do when they were back, they were like, we want to work on the language. Because we realized that if we went to school, we don't know anything about our language. So it, it was really interesting how you know this uh, happened. And then we started doing a literacy project, um, creating materials, and then now teaching it you know, to um, children. And uh, uh, so we have, I had this uh, uh, during the pandemic, so kids, were like out of school, we were like, yes, now the children, you know, can be our children. And uh, so we started a literacy project and uh, um, over the phone. So I will be in Oaxaca City sending them materials on WhatsApp and then the parents. So we got like a group of parents of different ages. So then I will send them a story and then uh, the children will read the story and, uh, and then they will read, they will call me back and believe me, to hear a child's voice during the pandemic, it was the sweetest thing to hear. It was so lonely, right, to be by yourself. So then this project was so, like, to me it was like, okay, I'm still alive. And they will call me and like, okay, I wanna, I'm ready to read the story. And so then I will follow the story, but then I will record them. And then I will send them the recording back and the children will be their judges. They will decide if they felt that they read uh, with fluency or they needed to go back, you know, to, to read the story again. If they felt that they were ready to move to a different story, then I will send them another story. So I was a little bit, you know, a controlling thing on my part to do that. But uh, uh, it was a really interesting dynamic with them. And this is, uh, I, I was visiting uh, the village once the pandemic was over. So I went in the street, and this child was carrying a phone, and my voice was on the phone, so I took a recording of uh, him. Can you please play? Um. Oh, should I? Okay. I think maybe I can see him. What was it in? Um. Yeah, there. Oh, yeah, there it is. Yes.
pudiera. Espera. Ah, buena. So, he is listening to his brother. Uh, so the recording that I sent him was to the brother, and then so he probably got a hold of the phone, so he's listening now how the brother is reading a story. So anyway, so that project just went wild, and it's like, you know, all these children using cell phones, and um, so how do, what do we use? So I'm going to go really fast from here. We use a, um, a platform that is called Story Weaver. It's based in India. They have, like, thousands of stories in uh, uh, different languages and what we do is that uh, uh, you create an account uh, and then there is a story that you like you say I want to translate the story and then you get a box and you translate the story and then once you're done um, you know finish and writing the story you save and the story is ready and it's available in many languages so we have a folder that is for Chatino we have many Chatino children books in there so it, it's been a really fun a project, and we do this with the uh, the people in the university. We do it with mothers. We do it with children. So we use it as a you know tool to teach people how to write in uh, Chatima as well. So we um, were able to get a donation of computers, and we put all this material into the local computers so the children will have materials to uh, to work with. And uh, um, we also made a keyboard, so if we want to text and, you know, do Facebook, we, you know, Instagram. And so we, um, with someone here at Google, uh, who works at Google, it wasn't a Google project, he just works there. He's an engineer. And so I met him uh, and I said, hey, can you help me do a keyboard? He's like, yeah. So we work on the keyboard. It's really cool. So you can, you know, see the tones and uh, uh, we represent all the tones, by the way. Mm, so here, this is a, a way for me to sneak into the schools now. So I don't tell them, like, I don't ask permission to the government or anything. What I do is, is that I work with authorities, and uh, uh, what I've done is, is that I tell them, look, um, because I go volunteer at the school, and, um, and then I say, can I um, have uh, a day when uh, uh, moms can go uh, read to their children? And they're like, yeah, yeah, you can do that. And then I um, ask for donations so people can donate money for two teachers who can be full-time at the school. So then, since the teachers don't know how to write Chatino, they don't speak Chatino, some of them do, but they speak from a different variety. So what they do is they go to, uh, now they are like, you know, working every day, they're teaching children, they're reading stories to children. They are teaching children how to read and write, and it's all in Chatino. And so the first test that we did was to go bring a story to the children and give them one book, and they all have the same book. And the two women are the teachers. They're reading the story, and, uh, um, and children, they just love to hear the language uh, and see their language um, in, uh, in a paper. So then, so... We have to, you know, always be uh, translating and making stories so that the children will have materials. So that's something that I feel that is really positive. Now children are able to have their language in uh, the classrooms every day, right? Um, and that's uh, also um, organized a group of women that we, uh, they're trained to do consultants, so we give them interpretation workshops, translation workshops, uh, we also, you know, uh, do a lot of uh, pedagogical materials, and they're from different uh, communities, and uh, uh, Claudia and Marty, they're from my community, and the other two ones are from our community, and we, now what we're doing is that we are uh, incorporating more women, because it's a, it's a way for them to be able to have some tools that they can make some money. They, you know, sometimes transcribe for people and uh, they are able to, you know, do some, um, bring some income uh, to their homes. And uh, the last uh, part is that, uh, as I told you, uh, 20 years I started this Chatino project, uh, but the research part of it, right? And uh, we, all the materials that we collected from these communities, 
um, videos and audios they are in our archive and uh, um, in, in Isla is the Latin America um, archive for indigenous languages in this space in Austin and what uh, um, we are doing now um, as part of the 20 you know anniversary year we want to bring back these materials to the communities because they are available uh, for them to use and uh, what it was really like uh, moving was that we went back to Zacatepec where we've done uh, work and this is Zacatepec and that's um, Kiaije. It was so beautiful for the children to see their grandparents, to hear their grandparents because a lot of them already passed away and so they wrote, like what I want is, is that look you know we've done all this work and now it's up to you like if this is this material should be available to you in uh in your grandma your aunt you, like a lot of those people pass away and now like if these children were like wow i want to see you know my grandpa i want to hear his voice so it's been really interesting so that's what i'm gonna you know what i'm gonna go with uh, um with this year and i'm just gonna go uh, socialize the archives so people can have you know uh, that material and so, basically, I'm really uh, my group, right? Uh, uh, my projects, and I, you know, who I work, you know, for at the children, because I feel that uh, you know those are the ones who are going to, you know, be continuing this if you know, if they want to, right? And uh, um, this is a really beautiful piece that uh, Yasnaya responded to Malik, right? It says that. Uh, so when a language is lost, what matters is what has happened before. That is to say, a series of terrible violations of human rights. I want to see flourishing of indigenous languages because it is a sign that the linguistic rights of speakers are being respected. That they are not suffer attacks, do not take bullets into their heads, they are not strung up to hang, that they do not suffer racism. I care about indigenous languages, uh, but I care more about the speakers. The default should be that a language uh, lives. When a language dies, it is because human rights violations have been systematically exercised on its speakers. That's what matters. Thank you. Okay, so we have time for some questions. Um, the, the date is right, 1981. So she wrote this 40 years ago. Wow. Sorry. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was such a powerful and wonderful presentation. Uh, and I'm wondering, when you think about your vision for these linguists in the community in like the next 5, 10, 50, 100 years, what, what do you think that trajectory, trajectory will look like? Um, actually, I asked uh, that to people in my community, and when I did this uh, for the 50th anniversary, I went around with my canvas and I said, what do you think? Uh, what is going to happen to our language? And uh, it's really interesting, like, and of course, right, I don't, I don't want this language to disappear because, you know, but, uh, there are many reasons why um, I think it, uh, it should survive. And uh, um, I feel that um, it's not looking good. The future, uh, even um, if you have children learning this language, even if you know the um, the parents are trying, so you have this huge tendency that um, uh, major languages, like you know, uh, larger languages, uh, should be the ones that survive. Right? And since that, I don't think it's gonna survive, but it's not gonna see. I'm not gonna see it. I mean, I'm sure that it's not gonna happen. You know, in 20 years, but I remember 20 years when I started this project, um, in many communities, like children were still learning the language, and then I go back and no more, right? And it's like you see it. And so um, a lot of profession, uh, professional ones, like they, uh, when they go to school, something happens, even though if they are from the community, they only speak Spanish to the children. So. Those who like maintain the language are mainly like people who are you know, staying in the community. They do farming. They uh, so a lot of them they come to the U.S. and of course uh, the U.S. is a completely different situation. So um, the racism that indigenous people like face in Mexico when they come here that happens to them with the Latino communities. And uh, so uh, they say, well, we don't speak an indigenous language, right? We 
you speak Spanish, and so that's. Uh, so um, I will say that uh, um, the people in the community they really tell me like in all the videos, no, Chatino, it's going to stay, and I say, how do you know? Well, because look at us, like before they say that it was going to disappear when we're still speaking the language. I really hope that that's the case, but uh, I definitely think that uh, uh, if we don't um, put this into the context that the UNESCO and the Mexican government says that they were, you know, they wanted to put it, like it, you know, uh, in other countries, like in India, right, they have a law that says, okay, TV, if you're going to show a program in another language, you have to, you know, have the written form in the local language. So they have, there is a lot that says that, right? So in Mexico, this is like, in uh, uh, the officials, like the uh, people that, you know, um, how would we call them, bureaucrats, or whoever, like, goes to those communities, then it's not required for them to even learn about indigenous cultures, indigenous, you know, uh, people. Like, they just, you know, say, okay, you're a lawyer, okay, you, you know, do that. And uh, um, so... I think that it has to really, like, the, the state has to, like, really show that they're, you know, interested in doing something, and it has to start from, you know, uh, that section as well. But they have to be trained, and also I feel that there are many indigenous people who don't have jobs, and they are, like, bilingual, and they can, you know, do a lot of the, uh, the work, and so I just feel that I... Um, Unless there is something that is directed, you know, that uh, um, in education, in the health system, and also I think it respecting the territory of indigenous people as well, because a lot of the times uh, when you have lawyers coming to uh, your place because they're going to do mining or something, and they say, well, uh, I wish, like, I work with the local governments in a, um, in a case that it was. Um, about um, uh, not mining, it was like a more, uh, they were click cutting, you know, the forest. And they were like telling me, I wish I knew how to speak Spanish so I can defend myself. Mm -hmm. Right? And so it comes to the level that it is so direct that it's sort of like frustrated. It's just like, why I speak this language and what is going to, and, and I'm not going to be able to, you know, uh, defend myself. Well, that's why we need interpretations. The interpretation should be, you know, part of that, right? And so I, um, I think that they, um, there are a lot of things that can be done, but um, I don't think it's, like Yasna is saying, it's not just about the languages, it's about the people. And so we really need to think about, you know, uh, the rights of indigenous people. And then, you know, together with this, you know, um, is the language. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. What, what really stood out to me was just the example of Tren Maya, mm -hmm. because if it's going across such a large uh, territory with different languages, uh, I was just curious, has there been, have you seen an effort towards, you know, um, translators and messaging and when they do go through areas um, that, mm -hmm. you know, affect biodiversity and there's clear... No. You know, no, 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 it's, <laughs> it's for another presentation, it's very complicated, but no, I think it's, uh, um, they, um, I think that they, um, uh, a lot of those corporations, the way they work is that they go with someone locally, and that person locally has to do their work first. And so um, so then that person, you know, a lot of the times those people speak the language and that's how they start convincing. You know, they have to kind of plan this well and they know how to do it. But uh, um, a lot of the, uh, they have the rights and the uh, law for the linguistic rights. It says that, yes, they need to have, you know, interpretation and any decision that is done in these communities. But, uh, um, uh, not, you know, it's not often, you know, done like that. Mm -hmm. Are there any books uh, dating back to the that you know, that they um, interpret and they have some, not exactly a form of dictionary, but some kind of, whatever was in Spanish, you know, the mandates, was there any translation for the books? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Peru, there is. Uh -huh. 
it's 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 not quite a bit, but it's in um, there's a city in Antigua that there's interpretation of the initial exchanges between the conquistadores and the uh, indigenous people. No. Yeah. Uh, for the Chatinos, no, but for the, some of the languages, yes. Uh, okay. For like uh, a lot of the uh, the Nahuals and Mayas, um, but for uh, Chatinos. It's really interesting because now we started kind of to learn about Chatinos, but uh, uh, even in Oaxaca, when I was said like, "Oh, I'm a Chatino," I said, "What is that?" Like it, it was a, it's a very small uh, area, and it's about like forty. They said that the number of speakers it's I don't believe those numbers, but uh, um, forty thousand speakers. And the way like uh, uh, I think it's more accurate sometimes is is that when you go to community and uh, I just look at the more social linguistic situation of the language by seeing how the children right are using the language like where they're using the language and uh, uh, if the number is about forty thousand it's a quite small um, it's not a large like other languages like uh, you know Nahuatl or Zapotec or um, some of the Mayan languages, but even with that, when we say Mayan languages, we're talking about so many languages, right? And even with the uh, Nahuatl languages as well, it's really you know, large, different varieties. Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm going to right now stop the broadcast part of our session, and we will continue some of the questions that we still have uh, here with, with our guests. I do want to remind everyone that next week there is no seminar happening here at Bolivar House because we have a whole day uh, from 10 to 5.30 uh, at UC Davis. We will be having this conference called Challenges and Redefinitions of the Left in Latin America. We will be discussing, you know, all day about the left in Latin America, but it's going to happen in Davis. It's an effort with uh, San Jose State University, Stanford and, uh, and Davis. But thank you so much, Emiliana, for this wonderful talk today.